how far to arrive delay. Welcome everyone to Carroll College St. Patrick's. My name is Thomas McGrath, and on behalf of Carroll College, it is my pleasure to introduce today's public lecture, which is being given in Irish history, with particular reference to the leading certificate curriculum. Our lecturer today is Dr. Elaine Callanan, lecturer in history on the BA Honours in Arts and Humanities, and the BA Honours in English and History here in Carlo College. The title of her lecture is Sinn Féin, the 1918 General Election and the Anglo-Irish Treaty. Dr. Callanan is the author of a recent book on this period entitled Electioneering, and Propaganda in Ireland, 1917 to 1921, Votes, Violence and Victory. As well as lecturing on the undergraduate degrees in history, Dr. Calden is also the program director of the MA in Irish Regional History in Carlow College. We're very pleased that so many of you have joined us today for this live streamed lecture. Normally, we would have our Carlo schools in this hall, but with the present strength of the pandemic, that is not really feasible. So we are delighted to be joined by schools, not just from here in Carlo and surrounding counties, but from all over Ireland and by people in various parts of the world. Dr. Callanan will speak for about 45 minutes, allowing 15 minutes for questions, and I will put questions from the floor to Dr. Callanan at the end of her lecture. So now it is over to Dr. Elaine Callanan for today's lecture from Carlo College. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone, uh, and you're all very, very welcome. I'm going to talk to you today primarily about the early years of Sinn Féin, um, and as Dr. McGrath said, the rise of the party in 1917-18 and on into the Anglo-Irish Treaty. To do this, we will have to jump over some of the rebellions and wars because the aim today is to look at their impact on politics and society in Ireland. So to begin, I'm going to take you back to the late 1800s uh, and to Arthur Griffith's Sinn Féin. The Sinn Féin party was the most important of several new political movements which emerged in the first decade of the 20th century. And its dominant figure at this stage was Arthur Griffith. Above all, Arthur Griffith uh, was a journalist, a man of ink and print, headlines and deadlines. And from 1899 onwards, he edited a formidable series of newspapers, for example, The United Irishman, and he also contributed columns in some of the other well-known newspapers like the Weekly Freeman's Journal. But to understand uh, why he needed or believed that there was need for a new political movement, uh, we need to look at his background a little bit. In 1897-98, Griffith spent two years in South Africa and the Transvaal, and this hardened his anti-imperialist attitudes. With the outbreak of the Boer War in 1899, many Irish nationalists were outraged that the British government did not respect Boer independence, and some even went to South Africa to fight against the British forces in the Boer Wars between 1899 and 1902. Now, the word Boer, by the way, translates into the word farmer, uh, but they represent two republics uh, that were fighting for independence at the time. But these wars ended with a British victory, uh, and both republics will be incorporated into the Union of South Africa in 1910 to become a dominion of the British Empire. But throughout all of this, Griffith was strongly pro-Boer. And at the time in Ireland, uh, there was a number of national movements that had been created. For example, the Gaelic League, the Literary Revival Movement, the GAA. And uh, their, their main aims were to promote Irish history, language, literature and sports, just to name a few. Politically also, there was the Irish Parliamentary Party. And uh, for many years, this had been under the leadership of Charles Stuart Parnell until he was caught having an affair with Kitty O'Shea and then his ultimate death in 1891. And the Irish Parliamentary Party had been seeking a home rule parliament in Ireland. Uh, and that had been their campaign really for the last number of years, but they hadn't managed to succeed. Both the first and the second home rule bills had failed. 
The Irish Parliamentary Party itself ended up splitting into two factions um, over Parnell's indiscretions, if you like, um, in, into the Parnellites and the anti-Parnellites. And to overcome this division, if you like, um, after Parnell's death, John Redmond was appointed as chairman. And he, the, the main aim was to try and bring these two factions together, um, again, under the one banner of the Irish Parliamentary Party. Now, Redmond himself had supported Parnell, but he brought in John Dillon, who had not, uh, he'd been one of the anti-Parnellites. And the party united under the aim then of attaining home rule for Ireland. Uh, and this parliament, if you like, would look after all of Irish affairs, or at least that was the aim at the time. So politically uh, in Ireland, you had the main Irish parliamentary party, but you also had those new nationalist clubs and movements that were springing up around the country, including those founded by Arthur Griffith and men like Bulmer Hobson. And towards the end of 1906, discussions were held with these nationalist groups, uh, these separatist nationalist groups, with the aim of combining uh, into one kind of organization. And by April 1907, the likes of the Dungannon Clubs in Ulster emerged with Common Gael, and the new party adopted the name the Sinn Féin League. But with the Irish Parliamentary Party, what were Griffith's views on them? Because they too were seeking a home rule parliament. Well, Griffith actually believed that all Irish parliamentarians who sat in Westminster were only participating in an illegal activity and assisting in the perpetration of a crime against Ireland. And he said, no lapse of time, no ignorant, ignorant acquiescence can render legal an illegal act. And the illegal act that he was referring to was the act of union. So he believed parliamentarianism was wrong because it was a recognition of a usurped authority and it proved to be morally and materially disastrous to Ireland. And he believed that the only alternative to parliamentarianism was passive resistance. Members of Parliament uh, were elected in Ireland, but they actually went over to Westminster to conduct uh, the, the Irish business, if you like. Griffith believes that they should not do this, that they should abstain from attending Westminster and set up a Parliament in Dublin. But he didn't get these ideas alone. Um, he was actually looking outward to get these ideas, and he looked primarily at the Austro-Hungary dual monarchy and saw this as a parallel for Ireland. Austria-Hungary was a constitutional monarchic union, union and it had been established under the Austro-Hungarian Compromise of 1867. And the common monarch was the emperor king. Griffith believed that a separate Irish legislature should follow this Hungarian policy and the policy of passive resistance, and that Ireland and Britain, like Hungary and Austria, might agree to share a monarch, provided that the two nations should be equal and independent. But he didn't want to fight or battle against the Irish Parliamentary Party or even unionists in Ireland. He wanted to convert um, supporters of the Irish Parliamentary Party to his views. Um, and the same for unionists. And that's why he had the idea of keeping the, the monarch, if you like. So in the end, Griffith's National Council merged with the Sinn Féin League. And in 1908, the party changed its name to Sinn Féin, which translates into We Ourselves. So Sinn Féin begins life as a monarchical party, um, but it will change in very, very quickly in the coming years. And um, Griffith believed that the only Irish government that could survive would be one that represented the existing divisions within Irish society. And of course, the divisions in Irish society were between nationalists and unionists, Catholics and Protestants. Griffith didn't believe that the Republic would do this uh, because of the position of unionists, because they wanted to maintain the union. Irish people would have to create a government that represented the diversity of the nation. So initially, Griffith's party does reasonably well, it begins to grow. But the party's fortune soon changed, and its slow early growth was followed by a rapid decline. And this was probably due to Redmond coming in and taking over the Irish Parliamentary Party in, um, in the early years. The Sinn Féin Party also stood aside from two very important elections in 1910. And in these elections, the outcome in Britain was that the Conservatives and Liberal parties both attained the same votes. So the balance of power ended up lying with the Irish Parliamentary Party, who had been very successful in Ireland. So in other words, whoever the Irish Parliamentary Party sided with was going to become the new government. And the Irish Parliamentary Party had in the past and continued 
to side with the Liberal Party because they always looked more favourably on Irish issues. So um, this gave John Redmond the power, if you like, to make sure that the third Home Rule Bill was introduced um, and this could become a possibility. And the other thing that happened uh, in the early, in 1911, was the Parliament Act. And this uh, meant that the House of Lords no longer had the power to reject a bill outright. So when Home Rule was introduced in 1912, there was now a really strong chance that it would go through and come in no later than 1914. On the Sinn Féin side of things, um, the IRB, the Irish Republican Brotherhood, had infiltrated the party. Now, this wasn't unusual. They'd infiltrated a lot of the nationalist organisations. But the IRB began to lose interest in politics at this time. So the Sinn Féin party survived, um, at least in theory, but it, not much activity took place outside of its headquarters at 6 Harcourt Street until uh, one big event happened. And that was the Easter Rising or Irie Macrocosta 1916. And as you all probably know, the Easter Rising lasted from Monday the 24th of April to the 30th of April 1916. And about 1,250 members of the Irish Volunteers, led by the school teacher Porrick Pierce, joined by the smaller Irish Citizen Army of James Connolly, along with members of Common Man, seized key locations in Dublin City and proclaimed the Irish Republic. The General Post Office was the centre of the Rising, and Corey Pierce read the Proclamation of Independence from the GPO on Easter Monday. Now, I'm not going to focus on the events of the Rising, but rather I'm going to focus on its aftermath. Uh, because in the immediate aftermath, uh, there were many arrests and executions. The British General, General Maxwell, quickly ordered the arrest of all dangerous Sinn Féiners. And, you know, for the first time, we begin to see that name Sinn Féiners being accredited to those who started the Easter Rising, even though it was actually inaccurate. Um, he said that uh, he was going to arrest all dangerous Sinn Féiners, including those who have taken an active part in the movement, although not in the present rebellion. And about 3,400 men and 80 women were arrested. And then in a series of court martials, which began on the 2nd of May, 90 people were sentenced to death. 15 of those, including all seven signatories of the proclamation, had their sentences confirmed by Maxwell and were executed by firing squad between the 3rd and the 12th of May. So Roger Casement, who had tried to bring arms into Ireland for the Easter Rising, but having caught, was tried in London for high treason, and he too was hanged at Pentonville Prison on the 3rd of August. Now, it is important to mention that the Easter Rising took place during the Great War, which had started in 1914. And during that, Britain had introduced an act known as the Defence of the Realm Act. And this act stated that civilians breaking the rules of the Defence of the Realm Act could be courts martialed, where the maximum penalty was death. So uh, Griffith himself took no part in the Rising, um, but he was still imprisoned. Uh, and that was largely because of his writings in some of the new, his own newspapers and other newspapers, which were considered seditious. Griffith himself had sought no practical outcome for the Irish in this particular rebellion. Um, he didn't condemn it, but he thought that there was better ways. Um, he believed they'd had insufficient arms, ammunition, and experience against the overwhelming superiority of Britain's armed might. And again, he advocated very strongly for abstention from Westminster and passive resistance. At first, very many members of the Dublin public were very angry with the rebels uh, for, for the rising in Dublin, particularly because of the destruction of property and the death of civilian life. Um, but as the uh, criticisms uh, begin to ebb, and as you know, comments are made on the fact that this was a Sinn Féin rebellion, things began to change. Um, and one of the big changes, of course, is going to be that people do not support the executions of those that created the rising, primarily because they were not military men, largely speaking. Uh, they were poets and they were playwrights. And uh, you know, people began to see the intelligentsia of Ireland, if you like, uh, being executed, and they, they, they did not like it. Um, the Irish Parliamentary Party, even the House of Commons, condemned the executions as well. But really what changed public uh, reaction or public opinion was the mass arrests and executions that had taken place. Uh, so a large section of the Irish nationalist opinion would sway from hostility 
or ambivalence towards support uh, from the rebels of 1916. In other words, they will begin to favor them. And we see this change happening in the immediate aftermath of 1916. And the, the symptoms of change, um, I've just missed it for you there on a slide, but I mentioned a couple uh, that you would have seen happening. Uh, one was the increasing frequency of memorial masses for the executed rebels, the growing sales of photographs of them, the setting up of aid funds for their families. And we also see recruitment levels to the British Army had diminished to a trickle. Now, this wasn't entirely because of the Easter Rising. Uh, the Easter Rising influences only in a small way. <clears throat> there were other mitigating factors, such as the high death toll um, of the Great War and the awful conditions of trench warfare. But nonetheless, it had a, a small impact on it as well. The harsh British response to the Easter Rebellion shattered Redmond's argument for Anglo-Irish friendship. There were further negotiations in the summer of 1916 to try and sort out and arrive at a home rule settlement, but these negotiations failed. So Redmond's inability to achieve a settlement led to a gradual loss of faith in the parliamentary party methods amongst Irish nationalists. Now the Great War will end on the 11th of November 1918, and the a general election date was set for the 14th of, De of December. Now, this is not unusual. At the end of all major wars and conflicts, they will rush towards an election, particularly the victorious side, because they want to secure as many votes as possible. So the general election um, is for the entirety of the British Isles, Britain and Ireland. And the important thing in an Irish context to remember about the 1918 general election is that it is an all Ireland election. It's a 32 county election. Uh, Ireland is not yet divided. There is no Northern Ireland. It is Ulster, Connacht, Munster and Leinster. But this election is going to lead to the reorganization of Sinn Féin as a broad based party uh, and a clear alternative to Irish party politics of moderation and conciliation. Throughout 1917 and 1918, uh, a number of things happened. Um, one was that uh, members of the ancient order of Hibernians and the United Irish League defected to Sinn Féin. They had originally been supporters of the Irish Parliamentary Party, but it, large numbers of them went over to the Sinn Féin side. The other big difficulty that the Irish Parliamentary Party is going to face is that Ulster Unionists refused to accept any compromise. They still wanted to remain in the Union. And their position had not changed um, really since they came out against the third Home Rule Bill uh, from 1912 to 1914. And I'm showing you some images there on the slide um, of some of the protests that they actually carried out during that time. At the very top, you can see the, the Ulster Solemn League and Covenant. Um, and this was a petition signed by thousands of unionists in protest against the uh, introduction of the third Home Rule Bill. And the photograph underneath it shows the leader of unionism at the time, uh, Sir Edward Parson, signing the Solemn League and Covenant. Uh, and you can see there that it's, it's a big round table with the union flag draped over it. And that was set out in Belfast City Hall um, as a, a big, huge propaganda exercise to promote this anti-home rule um, stance. The other thing that the unionists did was they created the Ulster Volunteer Force um, and that Ulster Volunteer Force was going to be used to fight against home rule if necessary. In retaliation in the southern provinces, the Irish volunteers were set up to defend home rule. So by the time we hit 1914, there are two armies on the island and both are, posed, uh, are poised for conflict and in the meantime they've also armed themselves. And the only thing that stopped the civil war breaking out in Ireland at the time was that the Great War started on the continent of Europe. By 1917, the other thing that was happening in Ireland uh, was the, uh, the decision or the, the suggestion that an Irish convention be held to try and arrive at some settlement for home rule. But unfortunately, this uh, Irish convention dragged on and on and on and eventually floundered on the questions of finances under a home rule parliament and of course the difficulty of Ulster or Ulster unionism and it eventually broke up in April 1918 with absolutely no agreements. But the Irish parliamentary party uh, faced further difficulties um, as the general election loomed. 
Um, John Redmond's health had began to deteriorate during the Irish Convention. And after an operation, he suffered heart failure and died on the 6th of March, 1918. He was succeeded by John Dillon. And Dillon had to face uh, really quite a large amount of difficulties in 1918. And one of them was that the military services bill was extended to Ireland. And what this means is conscription was introduced into Ireland. Now, conscription had been brought into Britain in 1916, but it hadn't been extended to Ireland at that point. Uh, but it was now in April 1918, as they tried to increase the forces to counteract the German spring offensive in the Great War. There was huge uh, anti-conscription reaction in Ireland. Uh, the Irish Parliamentary Party themselves walked out of the House of Commons in protest against this particular act. Back at home in Ireland, they joined uh, the likes of Sinn Féin, labour movements, the Roman Catholic Church, in a huge anti-conscription protest, which included strikes and speeches uh, from platforms and all of that kind of thing. And uh, of course, then this also feeds into the complete, uh, you know, anger with Britain um, over their treatment of the 1916 rebels, over the introduction of conscription. And in the immediate aftermath, or in the aftermath of the 1916 rising, as I said, the British government and Irish newspapers incorrectly blamed Sinn Féin for causing the rebellion. But Sinn Féin happily appropriated this cause because this woke the party back up again. Um, and it delivered them, if you like, a propaganda coup, uh, because now their name became associated with this battle for independence. And I'm showing you a headline on the slide there from the Irish uh, Times, which reads, Sinn Féin Rebellion in Art. So this is the kind of headlines that were appearing across the Irish and the British media at the time. In 1917, there was a series of by-elections um, and they are important because it's at this moment in time that the Sinn Féin party really begins to reorganize itself. And the by-elections give them the, the format to do so. Um, during the by-elections, the Sinn Féin made the decision that where possible, they were going to elect or appoint rebels as candidates, as political candidates, uh, in order to foster its association with the Easter Rising. And the other thing that happened during these by-elections was that it allowed Eamon de Valera, who had fought in the Easter Rising at Boland's Mill in Dublin, to take his place in politics. And the timing actually ended up being perfect uh, because sadly, Major William Redmond died during the Great War and he had been MP for East Clare. And this opened that constituency for a, for a by-election uh, to replace him. In total, throughout 1917 and 18, there was eight by-elections and all of them were contested by Sinn Féin or mostly by Sinn Féin. Of these eight by-elections, by -elections, Sinn Féin won five of them. They won in North Ross Common. And the reason I have a question mark there is because the candidate wasn't entirely a Sinn Féin candidate. There had been other interested movements that had nominated him as well. But some of the great ideas that Sinn Féin would capture going forward came from this by-election too. Uh, you had Joseph McGuinness, who was elected in South Longford, Eamon de Valera, who was elected in East Clare, W.T. Cosgrave, who was elected in Kilkenny City, and Arthur Griffith, who took the seat in East Cavan. The other three, um, South Armagh, East Tyrone and Waterford, were won by the Irish Parliamentary Party. Um, but it does give an indication of what's to come. Um, the Irish Parliamentary Party had been quite successful in two of the northern, albeit nationalist, constituencies and Waterford City. Now, Waterford City was a Redmond bastion, um, and it remained so throughout all of this period. And so much so that a Redmond held a seat in the Waterford City constituency until 1952. So that will tell you just how much they were supporting uh, the, the Redmond family. Uh, the by-elections also allowed Sinn Féin to organise themselves, as I already said, and they did so at their 1917 Sinn Féin Ardèche. And during that Ardèche, uh, Eamon de Valera was elected leader, and a new, more radical policy was adopted. And this policy uh, was abstention from Westminster, going back to Arthur Griffith's original idea. In other words, any Sinn Féin MP that was going to be elected 
would not take their seat in Westminster. And the other idea they had at the time, which came out of the Northwest Common by-election, was that they would not appeal to the imperial parliament like the Irish Parliamentary Party had done. Instead, they were going to appeal to the end of war peace conference. At the end of all big wars, there's a peace conference to try and sort out usually territorial disputes. They knew this was going to come at the end of the Great War, and it did. It was held in Paris, and that was the one that they were going to aim to have Ireland's independence recognised at. Now, they never got into the peace conference, but that didn't matter in 1918. This was their idea. Um, so by the time they entered the 1918 general election, they had a certain amount of impetus behind them from the by-elections. And um, when we enter the 1918 general election, we have three main political entities that are contesting for seats. We have the Irish Parliamentary Party on the Home Rule platform. We have Sinn Féin on the Separatist Independence platform. We have the Irish Unionists um, who want to maintain the union. The Labour Party did originally uh, decide to contest the election, but they ended up pulling out or withdrawing from the contest. And the reason that they gave was that they did not want to get caught between the Irish Parliamentary Party and Sinn Féin. And they wanted to leave a clear choice for the electors between the issue of home rule versus republic. But before getting into the election contest in Sands, there are some novel characteristics of this election which should be mentioned. Um, and one of them is uh, the increase in the number of people that could vote. Um, I've shown you a little uh, panel there on the slide. And if you look, you'll see that back in 1885, uh, over 700,000 people could, could vote in an election. By the time we hit 1918, that had increased to nearly 2 million. So in the closing years of the 19th century, those excluded from politics became eligible to stand for elections and to vote. And the representation of the People Act 1918 granted the vote to women over the age of 30 who were householders or wives of householders, owners of property over five pounds were university graduates. All men over the age of 21 were granted the right to vote. Servicemen over the age of 19 could vote. There was problems at the very beginning of this general election for the Irish Parliamentary Party. Uh, they had a, quite a large number of retiring MPs. And of course, the other problem, which continues to be a problem all the way through, is the Ulster Unionist resistance to Home Rule, and that continues to remain unresolved. So of the 105 seats, 25 of them are going to be uncontested. And in each of those 25 constituencies, Sinn Féin appoints a candidate, and that candidate secures a walkover. And the reason that uh, some of these constituencies remained uncontested is that other political movements like the Irish Parliamentary Party believed that uh, they shouldn't devote time, effort and money by placing a candidate in a constituency that was just unwinnable. In others, uh, the Irish Parliamentary Party just did not have enough time to replace retiring MPs. So how did the political parties and movements battle for seats in 1918? Well, they had different methods than we have today. Um, and there was a number of different influences. The two main influences that affected election propaganda in this era was growing consumerism. And this had accelerated from about 1850 with the advent of the department store and its display and mass selling to the more affluent middle classes who were driven by product acquisition and accumulation. And we see this in Dublin, for example, with the advent of or the, the, the development of Arnott's and Cleary's department stores. And the other great influence at the time was the Great War itself. Uh, the Great War had introduced the idea of mass media advertising. All belligerent countries found mass media to be an integral part of the social infrastructure, allowing propaganda activities assume a role of greater significance than ever before. In other words, they were using mass media propaganda to try and encourage people to support the war effort, regardless of what side you were on. Now, today, when we look at elections, you know, we see them being fought on television, on radio, on social media. They didn't have those means back then. Um, so the methods, that they, the methods that they used to sell their ideas were uh, outdoor public meetings. Now, outdoor public meetings were huge. Um, and this is where a candidate went into a constituency and gave their policies to an audience of people before them. 
These public meetings were very well attended um, because for, for a number of different reasons. People went because they supported the party or the candidates. Um, but they also went for the excitement of it. Um, I mean, there was an awful lot of pageantry around uh, some of these political meetings, particularly of a well-known candidate, like, for example, Eamon de Valera or John Dillon or someone like that was giving a speech. Because you had flags, you had banners, uh, you had pipe bands, you had entertainment all the way through. And these outdoor meetings uh, also had their supporting voluntary uh, volunteer organisations. For example, Sinn Féin's Irish volunteers would go along to these meetings to, to add bulk, if you like, in terms of numbers. Uh, and the same for the Ancient Order of Hibernians for the Irish Parliamentary Party. But these two rival factions would often uh, burst into fisticuffs and fights um, in some of the more contentious constituencies like Waterford City, for example. But big crowds meant that people could not always hear the speaker. We didn't have microphones back then either. Um, so, you know, the one the other really important um, piece of propaganda method, if you like, is newspapers. Editorial and newspapers became hugely important because a lot of the newspapers, particularly the provincial or regional newspapers, printed these speeches in full after the um, outdoor meeting. So if you couldn't hear the speaker, that was neither here nor there. Uh, you've got little snippets of it being passed back through the crowd. And then in your next edition of your local paper, you could read it in full. And that was very important for political candidates to get their policies across. Posters were also used. Um, and posters kind of communicated a sense of immediacy and being surrounded by a, an event. And they were used very, very widely um, to, to promote ideas and policies. And I'm going to show you a few in just a few minutes. Uh, and the all important canvas was also used, uh, the door to door. And this was essential for checking the register of electors, for face to face contact with voters, and to assure that voters would actually go to the polls. So, what kind of po posters did the political parties use? Well, here are some of Sinn Fein's posters. And if you look to the very far right, uh, you see a, a, a prisoner standing there with his arms folded in kind of defiance. And the headline says, put him in to get him out. Now, that means nothing to us. But if you lived in this time, you would know that all these arrests had happened and there was, uh, you know, candidates in prison. And this actually translates into put this candidate into government to get him out of jail. And to reinforce that message, the line at the end says the man in jail for Ireland. He hadn't committed a crime. He was fighting for Ireland's independence, and that's why he was in jail. If you look at the middle one, um, you see on the very, it's, it's not a very clear one, but on the very far left, there's this um, pixie elf-like character. Well, that's actually the Irish Parliamentary Party candidate, Patrick Lynch in East Clare. And he's holding a, a lantern that says sham convention. Yeah, so it's ridiculing uh, the Irish convention. And if you look to the right, you see Maiden Erin but she's shackled by foreign rule and taxation. But there's a signpost there, and it's indicating how do you get to freedom that's there in the sunburst? Well, follow the signpost, vote for Eamon de Valera, and he will take you there. So that's the type of propaganda Sinn Féin were using, and they also issued an election manifesto, which the Irish Parliamentary Party uh, didn't do quite so well. But they did also have their posters, but they relied very heavily on those outdoor meetings that I spoke about. And the image I'm showing you there is actually one of John Redmond at a home rule rally rather than an election meeting. But it's there to give you a general idea of what the crowd attendance at these public meetings was like. The middle poster um, was used in South Longford. And since I used the South Longford one for Sinn Féin, I used the same for the Irish Parliamentary Party. And here you see the Irish Parliamentary Party taking all those other separatist nationalist movements and throwing them in the bin. Uh, you know, they're, they're only a pile of rubbish as far as they are concerned. And that the real road you should follow is to vote for the Irish Parliamentary Party. And that is the way Ireland will get her independence. And they also ridicule Sinn Féin uh, by calling them the party of violence and intimidation and uh, referring to them as the physical farce party. Unionists, of course, were coming at all of this from a very, very different angle. Um, and what they were doing really was trying to encourage their supporters uh, all across Ireland to vote to maintain the union uh, between Ireland and England. 
And to do this, uh, they took down some of the accusations that were made by some of the other political parties uh, that were accusing England of robbing Ireland by taking all her tax money and all the rest of it. Unionists actually turned this on their head and they said, no, actually, without the, the Exchequer funding Ireland, you wouldn't have your, your farming, you wouldn't have your, your pensions and all of those kind of things. And they too had their pin badges, and I'm showing you one there um, as well. And you see that it is a rosette with the union flag on it, uh, with the words, union is strength. And that is the message that they were trying to get across in all of this. But do Sinn Féin make the Easter Rising a pillar of their propaganda as well? Well, Easter we did become the exemplar for Sinn Féin, uh, for their candidates and their supporters. In, as I said earlier, to award legitimacy to the bloodshed of the Easter Rising. But they walked a very, very tight rope of praising uh, violence in, in the Easter Rising and ennobling it, ennobling its rebels, if you like, uh, and while at the same time trying to seek an electoral mandate to pursue political ends. Uh, the regeneration of Sinn Féin as a respectable political entity while still retaining its connection to the Easter Rising um, and the now heroic martyrs of the Easter Rising was in a, actually masterfully choreographed. They did a very, very good job of it. The Irish party continuously vilified Sinn Féin's Easter Rising rhetoric um, and voters were asked if they favoured a party of physical violence over a constitutional settlement. And of course, stated things like, if you vote for Sinn Féin, you're going to lead uh, down the road of bloodshed. But these high ideals weren't the only issues. Uh, people on the ground are far more interested in things like old age pensions, housing, we're still talking about it today in politics, taxation and farming, these all came to the fore as well. And the answer, of course, always went back to home rule will sort it, staying in the union will sort it, or complete independence will sort all of these issues. And we don't have time to go into it, but partition was also a very big item on the agenda of political propaganda as well. So who won? Who did the very best? Um, well, the outcome was a Sinn Féin victory. Uh, Sinn Féin carried 73 seats, unions went up to 26 and nationals to six seats. So they had a catastrophic defeat. Uh, so when they go to the House of Commons, uh, they only have six representatives from Ireland and seven if you count in T.P. O'Connor, who was the MP for Liverpool. But it's also important to note the type of voting, uh, the voting system that was used, and that was the first past the post system. It's the system that's still used in Britain today, whereas we use proportional representation now, and that was introduced in 1920. So first past the post means it's a winner takes all election. Uh, so even if there were close battles between the IPP uh, in a few constituencies, if you lost, you lost, uh, you held no seats at all. The Irish Parliamentary Party will struggle on for a period of time under the leadership of Joseph Devon. But Sinn Féin saw the results of the 1918 election as a mandate to follow on their election promise of abstention from Westminster. So even though they hadn't mentioned Noel Aaron uh, in the election propaganda, in the aftermath, uh, in 1919, they create this new parliament called Dáil Éireann. And they did so on the 21st of January 1919. Uh, the British administration and unionists refused to recognise the Dáil. Uh, and on the 21st of January, the Dáil issued a declaration of independence and proclaimed itself the parliament of a new state. However, on the exact same day, two local Irish members of the Royal Irish Constabulary that were guarding Jellic Knight were ambushed and killed in Solo Headbag in County Tipperary by members of the Irish Volunteers. And this was the start of the Irish War of Independence. Now, the Irish War of Independence uh, was called for a number of reasons. Not all within separatist nationalist politics supported this political move. And um, they believed that the only way to get Britain out of Ireland was actually physical violence. Um, and they were advocating to go back to physical violence. They saw this new Sinn Féin political movement, if you like, emulating the ways of the old Irish Parliamentary Party uh, by relying on political persuasion instead of armed resistance to British rule. Um, and coming through, <clears throat> sorry, excuse me, coming through as well in the background of all of this was that third home rule bill. Uh, which is going to evolve into the fourth Home Rule Bill, and that's going to come into practice in Ireland. 
And that Home Rule Bill is going to set up two parliaments, or aims to set up two parliaments, one in the southern provinces and one in Ulster, uh, parts of Ulster, uh, with a Council of Ireland over it as well. And of course, they object to this as well, this partition too. What we see in the early stages of the War of Independence is raids for arms by volunteers. They begin to attack the local RIC barracks um, to steal arms and to get arms. And this continues uh, into 1920 and escalates in 1920 into a war of reprisals and counter reprisals between the Irish Volunteers, which evolves into the Irish Republican Army, and the British Black and Tans and Auxiliaries. And I'm not going to play out the War of Independence uh, because that will take us too long. I'm going to actually reach the very end of it because the War of Independence will end with a truce on the 11th of July, 1921. The conflict reached a stalemate. The Irish Republican Army were running out of arms and ammunition, except in a few pocketed areas. And Britain had received so much bad publicity over their conduct in Ireland during this time, an example being uh, the global condemnation of their actions in Crow Park in November 1920. So uh, negotiations began between um, Lloyd George for Britain and Eamon de Valera in 1920, but they were not successful. Uh, at the time, Lloyd George has insisted that the IRA surrender their arms before agreement was reached, but that this was refused. Eamon de Valera himself spent most of the war of independence in the United States of America raising funds uh, to try and fund this new counter state. Uh, and he actually did exceptionally well. He raised over $5 million, uh, even though most of that didn't actually come back to Ireland. But it was eventually agreed at a further conference that um, they really needed to open negotiations and discuss how the association of Ireland with the community of nations known as the British Empire may be reconciled with, the, with Irish national aspirations. And this is going to lead to um, the discussions and negotiations for the Anglo-Irish Treaty. De Valera had become president of the Republic of Ireland, and this also allowed him then to nominate plenipotentiaries for these treaty negotiations. And uh, so he put forward Michael Collins, Arthur Griffith, Eamon Duggan, Robert Childers Barton, and George Gavin Duffy to represent Ireland in these negotiations. On the British side, they're going to meet David Lloyd George, Lord, Bur Lord Birkenhead, Winston Churchill, Austin Chamberlain, Sir Lannan Worthington Evans, Sir Gordon Hewitt, and also Sir Hammer Greenwood, who's the Chief Secretary for Ireland. So they had formidable opponents uh, on the British side. And those negotiations are going to go on for, for quite some time. And the end result of them is going to be these main clauses of the, of the Anglo-Irish Treaty. Now, I'm not going to go through them all, um, but I am going to go through the two most contentious ones and another issue that really uh, put De Valera off the treaty. Um, one is, and I have highlighted in blue there on the slides, uh, members of the new Free State Parliament will be required to take an oath of allegiance to the Irish Free State and an oath to be faithful to His Majesty King George V, his heirs and successors by law in virtue of the common citizenship. Now, on the plus side, no other dominion of the British Empire had been allowed to take an oath of allegiance to their own state first and then the King. This was the first time this had happened. So the oath of allegiance was actually to the Irish Free State and an oath of faithfulness to the king. However, uh, separatist nationalists didn't want any allegiance or any faithfulness to any king whatsoever. So they were very angry with this particular oath. And the other big problem was Northern Ireland. Northern Ireland had now been created under the Government of Ireland Act. It had its own parliament. It was now opened by uh, King George V. So they had been offered in this treaty the option of withdrawing from the Free State within one month of the treaty coming into effect and withdraw they did uh, from the treaty. And that is really what's going to create partition in Ireland, uh, the difference between Northern Ireland and what's going to evolve into the Irish Free State. So the plenipotentiaries have to decide whether to sign or not to sign, um, and they held a, a number of meetings to do so. And Lloyd George, at the end of the negotiations, holds up two letters. One of these letters is going to be sent to the now leader of unionism, James Craig. One is going to say the Southern Irish accepted the treaty, the other is going to say they rejected it. And the, the, the negotiators or the delegates are going to have to decide which one it is. 
So they go off and they meet and they eventually return to Downing Street. A few minor adjustments are made to the treaty and the delegates signed the treaty. The House of Commons will ratify the treaty on the 16th of December with a vote, a very strong majority of 401 to 58. Um, and the House of Lords will also vote in favour. In Ireland, the story is quite different. Um, Dáil Éireann in the second Dáil will approve the new treaty after nine days of public debate, very, very heated public debates, by a narrow majority of 64 votes to 57. De Valera was very angry with the treaty because he had wanted to introduce this idea during the negotiations of external association. Now that's a little bit complicated. Uh, so suffice to say that he wanted to create a parliament in Dublin that would look after all Irish affairs with no interference from Britain, but that they would work with Britain on any matters external to Irish issues. Uh, and that was completely and utterly rejected. And he was very angry about that. Uh, he looked for a vote of, no, of confidence um, and he lost the vote of confidence um, by 60 votes to 58 and he's replaced by Arthur Griffith. Griffith will become the president of the Dáil, but sadly he will die in 1922, probably from overwork and exhaustion uh, from a brain hemorrhage. But what happens in the aftermath of this treaty is that the Irish public largely support it. When you read the newspapers, you see that businesses, county councils, the general public are supporting the treaty. They're probably utterly fed up of war, what with Easter Rising, wars of independence, the Great War. People are looking for peace. However, um, there are those that do not support the treaty. And this treaty signing, if you like, is a decisive event which will lead to the Irish Civil War. And no document uh, could have really effectively brought out into the open the divisions in the philosophy and leadership of the Sinn Féin movement. They completely split in half uh, over this treaty into anti-treatyites and pro-treatyites. Um, and the fate of the treaty itself will not be decided by popular will or the people of Ireland, but by the military and political organisations that exist in the country at the time. And it goes to show really, I suppose, in many ways that those organizations did not have a defined relationship or comprehension of the Irish population. And Michael Collins actually says to his fiance, the country is certainly clearly for it, he's referring to the treaty, but that seems to be little good as their voices are not heard. But these political and military divisions lead to the civil war, but I'm not going to go into that, I'm going to leave that for another day. And I'm going to say thank you very much for your time and for your attention, uh, and I'll take any questions that you might have. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Callan, for that very thorough and comprehensive lecture. A question from the floor here. Was the 19 <clears throat> general election, in your view, a landslide victory for Sinn Féin? And um, well, it was certainly, as I said earlier, a victory for Sinn Féin in that they captured the majority of the seats. But actually, when you look into the detail and when you bear in mind that this is an all island election, uh, the results are not quite as impressive as they appear on the surface. Uh, the turnout for this election is about 69%, which actually isn't bad. Um, and in the contested constituencies, 47% of the votes were cast for Sinn Féin. But then bear in mind those uncontested constituencies where they got a walk over as well. Um, and the other thing that stands out in this election when you really look into it is that there were a lot of abstaining and absent voters. In other words, there were still people out within the theatres of war in Europe trying to make their way home at the end of war and they didn't arrive in time to cast their votes on election day. And the chances are a lot of those votes would have gone to the Irish Parliamentary Party or to unionists as well. So that has to be borne in mind. And then there was a lot of people that didn't turn out in their thousands for this election. And that tells us that they probably had no interest in either Sinn Féin or the Irish Parliamentary Party, that they were looking for something completely different. And perhaps that completely different thing was the Labour Party, and that had pulled out of the election. So yes, Sinn Féin had a very strong victory, but was it a landslide? Well, perhaps not when you look into the detail. That's, that's most interesting. Um, you said that women over 30 got the right to vote. Why was the age of 30 picked for women and 21 picked for men? 
Um, yeah, why was the age of 30 picked for women uh, for this election? Well, you really have to look into some of the debates uh, and go back into the whole suffrage movement, which we don't have time to do here. But what you see really is this whole idea of, um, you know, were women capable of exercising their votes? Were they intelligent enough to cast in, in, in this way to, to vote? And really, in the end of the day, that's a minority, both within Britain and Ireland, that had this point of view. But in order to kind of get through women's votes in the end, they decided on that compromise of the age of 30. But there was another reason as well, and it goes back into the Great War. Um, I mean, if you think of the thousands of men that went out to fight in the war and died in the war, I mean, even if we look at Ireland alone, 210,000 Irishmen voluntarily enlisted and served in the Great War. And that's just those that enlisted in Ireland, not even Irish people that enlisted in Britain or Canada or wherever else. 30 to 35,000 of them died in that war. So they were also afraid that, the, that if they gave the vote to women over the age of 21, that there would be an, an impact, there'd be too many women versus men, um, and the vote would just completely skew in women's favor. So there was a couple of reasons for that, for that age difference. Thank you very much. Um, why, why did Eamon de Valera not attend the Anglo-Irish negotiations that led to the treaty? And why was he so vehemently opposed to the treaty? Well, uh, that is really what one would call, why, why did Eamon de Valera not take part in the treaty was the question. And uh, that is really the $64,000 question that's still debated ad nauseum by many historians today. Um, and, uh, he made the point, he argued that he was not the right person to go to the, uh, to the negotiations as part of the delegation because he needed to stay at home to manage all the kind of disparate factions in Ireland. Uh, like bring the Irish Republican Army on board in terms of any treaty settlement, uh, you know, work with the political elements of Sinn Féin in terms of any political settlement, and he really was in the prime position to do so. Others argued that, uh, you know, after his discussions, which I mentioned earlier with Lloyd George in 1920, that he knew he wasn't getting his republic. Um, and he didn't want to be the person that didn't get the republic that Sinn Féin had fought for and the Easter Rising had been held for. Um, so he stayed out of the negotiations and made, if you like, Mike Collins the scapegoat of um, those elections, or sorry, those negotiations or the, the, the happenings of them. Some argue, and I'll finish on this point, even though there's many more arguments that could be made about this, is that because he didn't get external association, he, you know, threw the, 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 the bat toys out with the baby or the baby out with the bat toys and just put its foot down and said, I'm not going um, and I, I'm not going to support this treaty. So there's a, that, that argument persists and consists to this day, and it depends on whether you like devil error or you do not as to what side you might fall down on. Say what happened to the Sinn Féin party after the Civil War? Okay, that's a very good question. Uh, what happened to the Sinn Féin party after the Civil War? Well, you know, it's important to note that between 1905, if you go back to Griffith, um, and 1926, there were at least four successive parties that used the title Sinn Féin. And these parties correspond to four distinct periods in, in Irish history. And you can go back, like as I mentioned, Sinn Féin began as a monarchical party, but it evolved into a nationalist party and then a republican and separatist party. And the fourth Sinn Féin party, which existed from about 1926 on, also very much dedicated to the republican idea, more or less retired from active political life in the Irish Free State. It became little more than a shell. Um, and that really remained the case until the current Sinn Féin party uh, took its form in 1970. And as we move into the Irish Free State, really the parties that evolved from that original Sinn Féin uh, party is Fianna Fáil and Fianna Gael. Um, and they go on, if you like, to dominate Irish politics uh, for, for decades, um, really up until the most recent past. Um, so, Sinn Féin really only comes back into the picture with any prominence, if you like, in the 1980s, um, and more so in the more recent elections of 2011. I think we've one online question here. 
He has another question. How were women executed after the 1916 rising? Uh, the question is, were women executed after the 1916 rising? No, um, but a lot uh, of people had their sentences commuted, including Eamon de Valera himself, because he was uh, battled on the grounds that he was a citizen of the United States. Uh, but in reality, so was Tom Clark and a few others had uh, that kind of citizenship as well, and they were executed. No, the women were not executed. They were threatened with execution. And um, Constance Markievicz, for example, the one woman that was elected in 1918, was um, threatened with execution. But no, that was not carried out. But you know, bear in mind that by that stage as well, that uh, the battles against the execution had resulted in, in I, I say only with the greatest respect, 15 of the 90 that had been uh, sentenced for execution being executed. Thank you very much, Dr. Callan. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so our thanks to Dr. Elaine Callanan for that very informative, indeed wonderful lecture. Our next lecture in this series will again be in history on the 24th of January, this day fortnight. It will be a conversation with Holocaust survivor, Tommy Reichenthal on the Holocaust and anti-Semitism. And Tommy Reichenthal survived the Nazi concentration camp Bergen-Belsen. 35 of his relations were murdered in the Holocaust. So join us at this time on Monday, the 24th of January, to hear Tommy Reichenthal speak about his experiences. You can find out details by following us on our social media and our website. And if you're not familiar with us, do check us out on the Carlow College website. Thank you for joining us today via live stream. Do email us and we will be happy to follow up with you on any aspect of today's lecture. Dr. Calden will be pleased to respond to queries on any aspect of today's lecture. So that concludes this meeting. Thank you for joining us for Dr. Elaine Calden's lecture today from Carlow College, St. Patrick's. Slánaguil Gulair. Garamagwith. <laughs>